Um, I'm filling in today for Stephen Eglin, my co-check uh, collaborator who, who cannot give this keynote. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to have this as my first appearance at the well-renowned uh, collaborations workshop series. Um, so today I want to talk uh, to you about code execution during peer review. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, in the end, I'll find a final an angle how that actually has something to do with actual code review. So on the agenda today, um, there is first uh, the project code check, and uh, then I'll talk about the reproducible agile initiative. Um, and uh, quick declarations and acknowledgements beforehand. Um, that I'm the reproducibility chair at the Agile Conference, as Stefan, meant, as Stefan mentioned. Everything that you don't understand or that don't explain well is probably better explained in our code check paper, which you can find on this link. The link to the slides, uh, sorry, uh, I put into the general chat on Slack. So if you follow along at your own pace, you can do that there. And uh, there's also a couple of acknowledgements here that um, we have received uh, support in, in different ways to do these uh, two initiatives. So code check, evaluating the reproducibility um, of computational results reported in scientific journals. Everything uh, on the project you also find on codecheck.org.uk. So code check in one slide. Um, on the premise, we start with that uh, somebody submits a paper to peer review, and this paper has some code and data attached to it. What we then do in, as, uh, in, during a code check uh, is that we take the paper, the code and the data set, then we run the code uh, on the data. And if our results are actually uh, similar to what we see in the paper or what the author created, um, we go to step five in this list. If not, we contact the author and ask, like, we have these problems. This is where things broke for us. Can you fix that, please? And then we iterate there a little bit and um, try again. And eventually, at least in all cases so far, we were able to uh, reproduce relevant parts of the computations. And then we write a little report what we could reproduce and how we did that. Uh, we also document mismatches or error messages that we got. And then we publish this report and also often help the authors to share their paper code and data publicly. So just that you have a, a quick overview of what sort of the situation is that, that um, I mean when I talk about a code check. So now a bit more details. Um, the situation and the, the, the premise or even the, the issue at the moment in, is that in the majority of cases, uh, researchers do not share everything that they do in their use in their day-to-day -day, uh, research work. They have data, they have intermediate results, they might use computational notebooks, they run different kinds of models, and uh, they have this all in the lab or in their computer. But when it comes to sharing, we still, in most cases, uh, resort to go back to a paper that we publish, and that's often in PDF format. And there's, of course, a disconnect because based on a paper, um, we don't, we cannot do things that we would like to do with code and data, and that is we cannot reuse them. We also have a very limited transparency, and uh, this is also a barrier to collaboration. Uh, so this is. This all means that uh, research today based on code and data is often ineffective um, and, and very intransparent. So what we should do and what many authors today do, but I would still say it's, it's far from the, the majority of researchers, we should be sharing the material here on the left and not the one on the right. Uh, you might have heard about the, the idea of uh, having a paper as uh, only the advertisement for the actual scholarship. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the situation today still is that often researchers write nice words about how their, how their new algorithm works. Um, 
and but that's really only a really really bad description of what actually happened there are different approaches to code sharing as as part of uh, scholarly communication um, there is the paper from now over 10 years ago by Nick Barnes that simply was titled publish your computer code it's good enough that points to um, issues that there still are with researchers being hesitant to share their their work. Um, there are different kinds of informal code body systems so collaborators might help each other out. Um, there are also is also the idea of research compendia so there's quite a few uh, people who've thought about how can we better share our computational work um, when we are leaving the PDF behind. There are different um, platforms that also big publishers have collaborated with um, to allow researchers to share computational notebooks in a very easy way. For example, here I have a link to the Nature Trial with CodeOcean, a commercial, commercial platform basically for uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and there are also approaches that are, especially, are uh, especially built for sharing confidential data, for example, the Cascade system in France. So another problem is often that researchers say, well, I cannot share this data because it's confidential. And there are technical solutions to that, but there are also practical solutions to that, um, that we, with the code check approach, um, think we can cover. So Kojic is um, yet another attempt at, uh, compared to these, these uh, ideas, uh, how to reintegrate the execution of code uh, into a publication process. So a few words about our philosophy. Um, if you uh, think about a working computational notebook that anybody can run with a single click uh, for a long time, we think that's a very high bar. Um, words like forever and everyone are pretty strong and, and I think almost impossible to achieve. So we set the bar intentionally very low. We simply ask, was the code executable for one person uh, at least once? So we are much closer to what typical peer review in academia is. And that is you publish uh, something or you share a, an, an article and then your peers take a look at that and these peers say uh, this is good enough for me or I have these reservations, these comments, and then you might iterate with them. But in the end, it's really a lot, uh, you need to put a lot of trust in the reviewers um, that their expertise um, is, is, um, gives the, the actual decision. Uh, so we check that the code runs and generates the number even the, the very bare minimum is just the expected number of output files. And um, the content of those files must strictly not be checked. If I do a code check, I normally do that. And I think in, in most code checks that we did up to today, that was the case that we, for example, compared the figure A that the author created with the figure A that the code checker created. Um, but Strictly speaking, we're not even saying that. We just have a list of files that should be output of the workflow. And if those are created, we say the code ran. Um, that's the important part here that we are not saying that the code is correct. We don't check that. We don't uh, also not check that it's sensible uh, in a scientific sense. Uh, we complement the scientific peer review and, and uh, are more like if you, if you imagine a car, we're not checking that the car is, has a high top speed or um, can, uh, can drive uh, off road. Uh, we're just check, checking that there's an engine and there's four wheels and something that resembles a steering wheel. More details on all this, uh, as mentioned before, in the code check paper. So, this, I'm not going to go into detail here. I just want to say that we have uh, come up with an example process how to do embed this, connect this with the scientific publishing workflow. So there's the publisher, there's an author, there's a code checker. And we think that we have come up with a good uh, way uh, that we can approach publishers with and say, this is what we can, would like to um, work together with you uh, on how to how to integrate code checks into publications. Just one thing that I want to um, want to look at here is that for us, 
uh, the deposition of the things that the digital artifacts that are created, in our case, the code track report, that this is properly deposited and citable. Uh, that is for us very important to give credit to the code checker. Uh, and we think that it's the publisher's responsibility uh, to do just that. Why is this just one, the one possibility to do code check? Um, here, I just want to highlight this a graphic from the, uh, from the paper uh, that we see there are many different variations how you can uh, integrate running, executing, and checking the code into a, a scientific peer review. So depending on how important, so I'm looking at the, the left-hand side of the figure now, how important um, you want to make this check. You can say, I'm doing it early in the process or later in the process. Uh, we are also happy with if a code check might be anonymous, uh, though I think it's very hard to realize um, that in an anonymous way. Um, there are many different roles who can do the code check. Um, it could be the scientific reviewer as well. It could also be staff. Uh, and there's, depending on the importance, um, as I said before, uh, when you do this code check. Code check. You, so you could do it early, sort of to filter out uh, papers that are not reproducible at all, um, or you could do it late sort of as an extra merit. And yeah, in all these variations, um, we've, we've thought a lot about that and we hope that we, um, that publishers or journal editors uh, can find a sweet spot that works for them and their community, um, because this really is something that every community has to um, decide for themselves uh, what is really the, the importance and how far do we want to take this? We've um, another perspective to look at this are our core principles that we have. So first we start with that code checkers record, but we don't investigate or fix something. Um, then the communication between humans is key for us in our experience. It's uh, way, easier, uh, way easier maybe to have the code check later in the process when a paper is preliminarily accepted. And then we can um, directly communicate with the authors and don't worry about anonymity, anonymity um, because it's a lot easier to go back and forth quickly and ask the author here, I have this problem. Can you please tell me, or do you have a solution to that? than going through some uh, anonymization system and, and uh, having a lengthy process to do that. Also, it's very hard to completely anonymize code unless it's really a small script that has no dependencies on, on, on anything that was created before. Uh, workflows must be auditable. So we say the author is responsible for creating something that we can check. And uh, the final point is that from our perspective, we want everything to be open. So we'd be happy to do this as part of an open peer review, for example. And transitional by disposition, big words for just saying, we are fine if nobody talks about code checks anymore in 10 years because it's just normal, uh, a normal part of peer review. So up to today, we've created now about, I think about 30 code checks. Some of them are examples where we've just created for, for some classical papers from neuroscience, that's Stephen Eglin's field, um, but also from GI science. So the, you see some journals that we've collaborated with um, and you always find a link to the code check repository and the, and the actual article as well. So, um, if you're interested in how these how a code check uh, output might look like, um, I invite you to take a look at our uh, register. A brief view and at such a certificate uh, that I mentioned before. So um, we always have on the first page we have our logo, of course, and some some um, bibliographic information about the article that we checked and where things are published. And then a little summary where the code check reports uh, what the what the output was. Um, and here in this case, for example, there's one figure uh, on the on a um, on the page four of the report, and a little bit of notes and and some code notes um, what the author or what sorry what the code checker had to do to create this this reproduction.
So with CodeCheck, um, what are our next steps? Um, we, so we, from our perspective, we've demonstrated that this works and we are now looking for journals to collaborate with um, to have this bare minimum of a um, code review, you could say, or code execution as part of uh, scientific papers that are shared. And we also want to train a community of code checkers, and we have many volunteers already. Um, and we might collaborate with the Reprohack group about that. So if you don't know what that is, please check out their new website. And we're also, uh, all for, for a few years now, even dreaming for funding for a code check editor, because to make this happen, especially for smaller journals, um, is not something that you can just do on the side. So I invite everybody here also to come and get involved, um, volunteer as a code checker, or if you are um, even maybe a journal editor and that kind of role active, please reach out to us if uh, you think this is something that your community um, could, uh, could use or could embrace. One of the communities that is actively doing code checks is the uh, reproducible, is the Agile community. In this case, Agile stands for Association of Geographic Information Laboratories in Europe. So it has nothing to do with Agile software development. The reproducible Agile um, initiative um, was created uh, a few years ago by now, so five years ago. We've had a series of workshops and um, then we realized, so we wanted to have a workshop about reproducible research. Almost nobody came. So we realized we need to advertise this topic. We need to make clear that there is a problem. So we wrote a paper about how not reproducible all the submissions to the Agile conference are and got some attention from the community. And we've created guidelines, which are now mandatory for all submissions. And uh, we've uh, by now had uh, 14 successful reproductions or code checks in the last two years and we are right now um, running the next reproducibility review. The idea in, in the Agile case um, is that we want to promote good examples and not exclude paper static that are not reproducible in our, in, in our view. Um, so the really the only mandatory thing that you have to do is that you have to have a data and software availability section in each paper where you say, this is where the data is, this is where the code is, and um, this is why I might not be able to share it. And we then help, try to help the author with a lot of links to guidelines and practical advice so that they share their material in a way that makes it directly code checkable or reproducible. So in the end, you then have, uh, if you pass the code check, you, in this case, you get a little agile reproducible batch, uh, both on the article landing page, as well as in the published PDF. And then that links to the report um, about the, the reproducibility review. And uh, we've, I think this is really a success story that, that you might be able to transfer to your community is that with a small team of enthusiasts and, and running a few workshops, we were able to um, get the attention and uh, raise awareness around the topic. Um, we did have to put in some work to assess the state of reproducibility, but that was really less work maybe than even expected because uh, when we tried to um, we did an assessment without having to reproduce any papers because none of the papers shared enough information to be um, actually reproduced. Uh, we were lucky to have some institutional support. So that is great about the Agile community that we had a little bit of funding to meet and also had the support from the organizers to um, realize um, our, our um, suggestions. And then, yeah, we decided that we just want to positive and want to do go want to want to go down the positive road, and we're not saying that um, reproduction impossible is bad science, um, but simply we acknowledge that there are pressures around um, academics that might make it very hard for them to share everything that um, that is needed. And then, yeah, you need, just need to need to have um, need to stuck stick to it. So what is RSE about all this uh, in my last couple of minutes? So I'll be 30 seconds over, Stefan. Um, 
I think the skills that, that you as RSEs have are crucial uh, to be a good code checker. And these skills that, that uh, around our research software engineering are currently lacking in the peer review process. Um, so we think that we should try to add those um, and uh, just getting to run somebody else's workflow can be very educational. Um, and uh, the um, yeah, very educational experience. And uh, normally, the, what I presented before was the minimal, um, the minimal amount of, of what we want to achieve uh, with the code check. But in reality, there's often a lot of back and forth and uh, a lot of great feedback that the authors then adopt and are very excited to get this feedback because they didn't get it before. Um, and if you start doing this as an, as an RSE, you'll get to know all the package managers, I promise you, all of them. Why is code review and not reproducibility review? So if you want to think about code review, luckily there are organizations and, and uh, journals that do actual code review and look at the code. We often, I give feedback on code quality, but that's not uh, demanded. Um, also, there's the code review community working group uh, with, uh, with a, a discussion session or workshop session tomorrow. I strongly encourage you to join though, to join them if you um, have been misled by these keynotes title that, and we were expecting actual code review. But even the minimal code review, I think that, that we do um, just saying, saying that some, th some documentation is good enough to be uh, executed by someone else, um, that's useful. Right, so this is uh, my second to last slide. Uh, what we are trying to do is cultural change and that's really very slow. Communication reproducibility is hard and it's not enough taught or checked uh, and doesn't get enough credit and we need to change that. So if you ask me about one thing that you should take away from this, uh, I've done, I think about 20 or 25 reproductions myself by now. Um, the one thing that I want you to remember is have a read me and all else is details if you're an author. And um, I'll leave that up there and thank you for your attention. And um, I'll look forward to your questions. <laughs>